Welcome to Love and Relo, the voice of the relocation industry. I'm your host, Ben Cross, and I'm so blessed and honored to be here with you all today. Round of applause. Excellent. Thank you so much. I feel the love. And <laughs> now let's talk about the Relo. Uh, let me first make sure you can actually hear me. And can you see my slides? Here in the back. Yeah, you can but hear me? You can make a full screen as well here. All right, and let There's me know if the, uh, if the slides are up. Yeah, slides are up. You can we see got, them. We got the slides, Parag. We're just trying to uh, right. make you full screen right now. All right, let me know when to, when to kick off. And here. You get full screen, I think, here. How, I don't know. Yeah, there it is, right there. There you go, bam! Oh. Go through and let Parag start the uh, conversation here. He's got a presentation for us, and then we're also going to have a Q&A here. So as he's speaking, I want you to engage with the content. You know how we format things. And then um, I want you to have questions and raise your hands. Um, throughout okay and then i'm going to be in the uh, audience with a microphone all right can y'all do that all right prague we're ready for you awesome great well i can't wait to jump into the conversation with all of you you're the pros you're the experts but i'm going to share some thoughts with some slides and then we'll jump into a discussion so i've titled this collecting people is collecting power and that's not just a turn of phrase it's really really important to understand that demographics talent are the basis of our economies. And right now we're in a situation where on the one hand, a couple of years ago, the world seemed to stand still. And now indeed, as Ben was saying, perhaps we're going to have mobility like we've never had before. So what's true, which is not true, what is and how that applies to the health, the competitiveness of our economies and everyone else's, that's what we're talking about here. And it all comes down to this war for young talent. So I just wanted to maybe even uh, even though I can't see you right now, almost a mental show of hands. During COVID, when we were all locked down, how many of you were thinking, what's my plan B? Like if I have to be stuck here forever or when I get out of here or when I have the chance to move again, where am I going to go? And maybe we thought it was just us thinking that, but in fact, it was everyone. Everyone everywhere was like, man, the second COVID's over, the second borders reopen, I'm going to go to my dream place and I'm never coming back here. Or if you were lucky, you were in a place that handled COVID well and you could still roam free in the great outdoors. But then remote work obviously took off. So you're saying, hey, I want to take advantage of this opportunity um, and, uh, and be, a, be a digital nomad. Now, just imagine 8 billion people thinking the same thing at the same time. Like, get me out, right? And what we're seeing unfold in the world today, like planetary scale, is this experiment. What happens when you lock down 8 billion people in 200 countries for about a year and then you reopen borders, right? Not fully open, obviously, but what happens? What, how do you resort humanity? And that's what I'm talking about. And that's what we're going to get into today. Now, to be honest, that wouldn't necessarily be new. And this is what the first thing is, the fundamental point that, that we need to start off with and appreciate. We've always been a mobile species, right? We are literally nomadic by nature, going back hundreds of thousands of years. It may seem like for the past couple of centuries, those of us who are lucky in America or elsewhere have been able to kind of be happy where we are. But it's not really true at a global, historical, like civilizational or species kind of level. If you go back literally to the beginning of time, people have always been searching for a better life. And that could be driven by these five, among other trends that I highlight here in this top box, right? Demographic imbalances means the gap between old and young. When countries are short of young people, they import them. That's what happened in America in the 60s. That's what happened in um, where there, when there's a talent shortage, Europe after World War II, the Gulf countries when they discovered oil, and so on and so forth. So people just move when there's labor shortages. Political upheavals. Well, you've got, you could go again back to ancient history. You could go to the 20th century and World War II. You can look at the world today. 
Afghanistan, Syria, Myanmar, Yemen, Venezuela, Ukraine, right? In fact, we've got about a half dozen major situations and locations globally that are the origin of mass migrations and exodus of refugees and asylum seekers. Look at people coming uh, over the border from Central America, partially political, uh, Africans trying to cross the Mediterranean. So politics is always going to play a role. Economic dislocation, technological disruption, meaning what happens when factories close, people leave and move. But what happens when remote work becomes possible and you can live wherever you want? As economic circumstances change, people move. And then there is climate change, which, of course, is the original driver of human migration. And it's back. And it's back in a big way. You add it all up. You're talking about a world in which you've got all of these drivers of migration going up and to the right at the same time. And you multiply that by the volume of connectivity. Planes, trains, and automobiles, right? The ability of people to just move and to say, I'm going to go where I want, follow my instinct, and, um, and relocate. That's, this is the, the mathematical formula for what's happening in the world today. And the crazy thing is, we're two years on from COVID when we thought we were locked down, the world stood still, no one would ever travel again. Instead, what we're moving into, into a world of hyper- hyper, hyper, hyper mobility. Now, who's doing the moving, right? So the first point is, again, the number of people right, who are going to move, who are going to relocate is, is staggering because we're talking about ever, over the past centuries, the decimal point always moving to the right. We used to have just millions of people relocating, then tens of millions. In the 20th century, we hit hundreds of millions. In this century, it's going to be billions, right, of people who will relocate for one reason or the other. But it's interesting that's happening at a time when the world population is reaching its peak, right? It's peak. And you may have been following this news. Um, in November of last year, the, we hit 8 billion people. The United Nations had a big announcement. Um, but the, the birth rate, the fertility rate is declining rapidly everywhere. There are many reasons for that. So instead of forecasting a world in which there are 15 billion people, actually, we may not even reach nine or nine and a half billion people. And that's going to be as soon as 2035. And a lot of countries feel that way already because fertility is so low. So you're talking about what is effectively a finite number of human beings in the world. For the last hundred years, we have not thought like that. Why? The world population was only two billion people a hundred years ago. It's literally gone up to eight billion people today. No one in this room, no one alive today, not your parents, not your grandparents can even remember a world when the world population was not going like this. But you, me, here, now, today, we're literally living through the plateau, the peak of humanity. And we're going to live to see the world population start to go down. But because it's basically already happening within countries, you can feel it. And that has enormous implications for our economy. This is uncharted territory. So lots of drivers of mobility and a finite number of people, right? Following me so far? Now, let's break it down by generation, right? And this is where we get into the war for talent. Because historically, each generation is followed by a bigger generation, right? So families used to have, even if it was seven kids and five kids and three kids, at the end of the day, so long as a society is having more than two children uh, per female, you tend to have growth over time. So that's what you're seeing here, the boomer generation, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z. But now look at Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha are the babies. Today's babies are Generation Alpha. And because of the financial crisis 15 years ago, and because of COVID, fertility has been hit so hard that Gen Alpha is actually going to be smaller than Gen Z. So if you have a Gen Z kid, that's the largest cohort, the largest generation of human beings that our species has ever produced and ever will produce. It goes down from there. So now you're in a situation which is literally sci-fi, right? Literally sci-fi. And why is it sci-fi? Because instead of the future um, always having a larger number of people coming behind us, Instead, the present generation of youth, which is millennials and Gen Z and Gen Alpha, right? The, the present is also the future. 
they are bigger in number than the people that come after them. They're the largest group of people today and also the largest group of people of tomorrow. And so the present is the future. And that's what sci-fi, right? Or feels like sci-fi. The present is the future. Wrap your head around this for a second, right? The present is the future because there's fewer and fewer and fewer people coming afterwards. And so tie it all together, take stock. If a country has the right number of people today and in the future, it's going to be healthy. If it doesn't, it's going to die. That's what's going on. Now, who are these people? Now let's talk about the young people. When I wrote that book, Move, I set out um, to really get inside the head of this largest demographic in the world. The most mobile people in the world are not babies and they're not old people. It's youth, right? They are the target. They are the talent. Now, depending on how old you are, your archetype in your head of what is a normal person, what is the average person in the world think? It's probably like, like us, like you're Midwestern or you grew up somewhere in a Western society, America, Europe, whatever. You know, you are uh, maybe married, you have a couple of kids, you own a home, you live in a suburb. Like we think that's normal, right? I got some news for you. That's not what the median human being is. If you take the 8 billion people on earth, and you line them up, and you take person number 4 billion, I'm going to tell you what that person's like, okay? That person is young, they're not old, right? They don't have children, they're not married, they don't own a home, they don't have a stable job, and they don't live in a rich country like America. They live in a developing country, and they might live in a big mega city. That's like what a normal human being, the average median person on earth today is that. Not you and me, not having the luxury of going to conferences and, uh, you know, doing lectures and networking, right? That, that's the, what we're talking about here. That's the talent base. And life is tough for them. But they've got values. They've got values that they believe in through social media, through exposure to kind of global culture, if you call it. And they know what they want. They know what a good life is like, what a good society should be, where they want to be, the kind of place they want to go to, settle in, work in, live in. It's a place where connectivity is like a human right. You know, uh, th that means primarily owning a mobile phone, having internet access, sustainability. Of course, they want to have an environmentally stable planet and mobility, right? The right to move, the right to leave anywhere and to go anywhere. And survey after survey after survey that we've done of young people or even just like, you know, scanning their Instagram feeds, whatever it is, we know that these are like the three values and virtues of the whole young generation of people all over the world. They may be from China or America or Russia or Nigeria or Canada or Germany. You would think that, you know, even if our countries are at war with each other, young people literally think the same everywhere. And we've got tons of data on this. And so if you want to be a destination, right, if you want to be that place or a company that is locating its offices and presence in the right geographies, Look for places where young people are going, where the politics favors opportunity, education, work-life balance, inclusion, um, and of course, climate consciousness and sustainability. Those are the things that young people are looking for. And they're going to be very picky about those things. Now, let's dig into a couple of things a bit more deeply, um, the demographics of it. Who are all these young people? I said the median person is young, childless, financially struggling in a developing country, and primarily in Asia. Asia is literally the majority of the human population on the earth today and tomorrow and the next day and for the next forever, right? There are eight or nine billion people in a world of nine billion people, uh, about five to six billion of them are going to be people in Asia, right? So it's not just that youth are the future. It's that Asian youth in many ways are the future. I find it kind of funny to be saying this because I guess that's sort of kind of me, or at least I'm not young anymore, but, but I am Asian, Asian-ish. So, but anyway, the numbers don't lie. If you look at the number of working age millennials, again, the talent pool, the, the, the lifeblood of, of companies uh, around the world, right? If you look at the number of working age millennials in Europe or in America, you're talking about a whopping 60 to 70 million, right? Look at Asia, that's close to a billion, right? And that's not even factoring, again, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, which, of course, are much bigger in Asia than the rest of the world. So when I get asked, what's, you know, talk about the future of the world, you know, in, in two words, 
I wouldn't pick any religion or ideology. Uh, I would basically say, well, you want the literal answer, the literal answer to the future of humanity, the literal answer in two words is Asian youth. Asian youth are literally the future of humanity. Like it or not, that's the world we're in, like now, like this not make-believe. This is the demographics of humanity I'm talking about. Now, you also may have picked up on the fact that it's going to be a lot more Indian than Chinese, right? The Indian population is larger, it's younger, the diaspora is bigger. You're starting to see that because of all of the um, geopolitical tensions with China also, you just have a lot more people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, pretty much everywhere. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this that relate to everything from talent, speaking English, uh, climate change, like geopolitics, lots of factors. But you're seeing that worker shortages around the world are being filled by Indians. That was already the case in the Gulf countries like the UAE and Saudi Arabia. It's true in Southeast Asia. It's certainly true in America and Canada and, um, in, in, um, and in increasingly in Europe, too, you're seeing a lot more of this. So let's, let's uh, you know, sort of crystallize the argument here. Gen Y and Gen Z and Gen Alpha are the most largest generation in human history. They're the most mobile generation in human history. They're coming of age at a time where pre and now post COVID, lots of countries are waking up and saying that they want to attract young people. You now have 100 countries with nomad visa, digital visa, talent visa, retirement visa, healthcare visa, you name it, programs and schemes. If you're a talented young person, there's probably never been a better time in history to be alive because some country better than whatever country you're in wants you. They want your skills or they just want you to stay in the Airbnbs and hotels and eat in their cafes. Whatever it is, they want you. Now, here's the crazy thing. Before COVID, there were like two countries that had nomad visa or talent visa kind of programs. Like Estonia is one of them. And that's a tiny country. Like I just said, a hundred of them do now. Again, whether it's investor residency or digital nomads, whatever. There's a hundred countries that are competing to collect people. Partially because they saw the demographic fate that they were facing pre-COVID some of it was because their economy suffered during COVID because, again, there are services economies that require the circulation of people. People having meetings and conferences, when that goes away, hurts your economy, right? So collecting people is collecting power. The demographics is actually geopolitical. And that's never been more true than it is today. I get asked all the time, you know, what will distinguish success and failure? How do you tell the winners from the losers in the 21st century? Who's going to win the 21st century? I just give you this answer. If you are a country that is collecting young people today, you will be fine. Those young people will fix the political problems, the climate change problems, the uh, infrastructure problems, the innovation problems. Young people, if they're staying in your country, they'll sort it out, right? But if you are a country whose young people are moving away, right? If you are Russia, for example, or Italy, you are committing suicide. Literally, you have no future because there are no young people coming after you. You're not giving birth to more and more kids and saying, you know what, we'll just solve the problem through more people. You're losing people. Your population is going down. No countries have their population go down prior to this century, right? But now you've got Russia, Japan, all these countries that are de- in their absolute number of people and they're not ready for it they already have high debt they can't afford it they don't have enough uh, occupants for all their real estate and they don't have innovators and talent and so forth so that's why focusing on young people as the subject of the conversation what they want where they want to be what jobs they want to have where they want to live all of those things matter and it's actually not just a matter for the relocation industry and companies it's literally a geopolitical issue so this war for talent has never been more relevant. We used to use the term, if you go back 20, 25 years, as like management consultant speak, you know. But it was really like, okay, does the super smart consultant or banker go to London or New York? That was 25 years ago. Today, it's all blown wide open. It's global. It's every sector. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's companies versus governments. It's developed markets and emerging markets. It's east and west, Right everything uh, or everyone is an active participant in this war for talent. You're even seeing it within companies, I'm sure, because I'm hearing about this, so you must, which is 
a person works for one company, but they want to go to the office in the country that has the four-day work week, that has a higher salary, where it's, life is more affordable. That's what's going on. So completely global and across industries, the war for talent today. So we have this map in our kind of present geography of the of the world population uh, distributed uh, and the movement of people that tends to be within regions. So, you know, within North America or Latin Americans coming North America, Europeans within Europe, Africans within Africa, Asians within Asia, that is going to be very different in the future in this completely global war for talent that we're in. You're going to see new geographies and vectors of movement. Um, you're already seeing them. Um, the evidence is very strong. Just look at Asians moving to Europe. Uh, when I was a kid, I spent a year of high school in Germany, and there were very, very few people who were not from that local you know, community there. Um, today, I go back and I see tons of Asians all across Germany. Um, and uh, they're from all, all, well, I mean, from all Asian countries, in fact, because they have such a huge skill shortage. And you're starting to see it in everything from agriculture to IT. Now, what are the locations that are going to be the winners? Again, where young people are going, yes. So I highlight Canada here. I highlight Germany. Um, but I'm looking at places also that are climate resilient because climate change is going to be a factor. You know, young people are thinking about where do they want to invest? Where might they want to stay? Um, where are other young people going? And like I said, climate stability, climate consciousness is a major factor for them. So I look at, look at you know, the Canadian data and young people moving there. I'm looking at Germany. I'm looking at England, which despite Brexit is making it easier for young people uh, to settle there. I'm looking at places like Kazakhstan and even Japan, which has actually 3 million foreigners. Their own population is going down. Their foreign population is going up. And I'm mapping out these places. So let's talk about Canada for a second. Canada is it's st staggering. They set themselves a goal 10 years ago to increase their population by 1% a year. And at the time, that amounted to 350,000 people, which is not a big deal. By American standards, we historically will have, you know, uh, 900,000 or a million people a year come in. But over the last couple of years, and in fact, last year, 2022, Canada took in a million new legal migrants, a million that's more than the U.S., and they have one-tenth our population. So they're overshooting their target, and they're actually competing and hustling to get talent that would come to America and getting it in their own universities and so forth. And they're favoring young people. So here's just an excerpt from MOVE when I talk about how the Canadian system basically says, you know, log in, give us your age, to show us that you have some degree of some kind from some institution, and boom. You're going to get in. You're going to move to Canada. One-way ticket. You'll be a citizen in three years. Super streamlined, super effective. And it's given them um, a huge edge now or increased their uh, capability to attract investment and talent. Now, I like, I'm going to go through in a couple of slides the kind of demographic segments that I'm looking at. So students, it always starts with students, right? The U.S. has been the largest recipient uh, of, of foreign students every year. But it's other places are catching up, not least Canada. The Canadian number needs to be revised up every single year. They need to build new universities. The number of foreign students is just growing uh, gangbusters. As I mentioned, their immigration system is super fast tracked. And also, it's pretty, uh, you know, they have a good vocational blend. You study skills, you get internships, you, it translates into full time jobs. Um, and they don't have a problem where, you know, if you're an immigrant and you lose your job, you suddenly have to, uh, you know, leave the country. They let people stay for longer. It's not tied to employment, uh, immigration isn't, and so on. Europe is trying very hard to get in that game. I mentioned Germany, um, mentioned the UK, uh, even Eastern European countries are trying to attract talent now. Again, digital nomads and so forth. And Asia, due to COVID, as well as their own economic growth, they're trying to keep Asians in Asia to be the engines of their, of their uh, uh, innovation. Now, as we do these surveys over the years and we look at what are the most uh, desirable destinations um, for professionals now, so not, not students, but, but professionals um, who are globally mobile, these surveys that are done, you know, I've tried to aggregate some of the data. Um, Canada is a top destination. As I mentioned, Asian markets are getting more attractive, like Japan. Um, and what are people looking for? What are talented entrepreneurs looking for? Well, they want to see that the, um, that the jobs are full-time jobs, not gigonomy. 
that the economy is diverse, that there is a strong government support for education, that it's affordable. Uh, all of these basic things, you might even consider human rights to some degree, but it's a wide open war for talent and countries are starting to up their game to be more attractive to these migrants. Now, let's take another segment, millionaires, right? People who can kind of pretty much go wherever they want. And this is where the passport uh, game comes into play. You have investor residency schemes, um, re citizenship by residency schemes, uh, where people are uh, moving to places like Canada, Portugal, Greece, the UAE. The UAE, have, of course, has this golden visa, which has attracted a lot of people. So whether you are want to escape COVID or escape, um, you know, authoritarian regimes like Russia, China, um, and, uh, and so forth. Or if you um, just want to park your wealth somewhere, people are getting very, very savvy um, for these or other motivations and determining where they're going to uh, domicile their wealth and domicile themselves. So again, these are just three examples of the global war for talent. Um, I won't go into too much detail, detail here, but you can break down this data in terms of who, like what category of people, blue collar, white collar, old, young, are favoring which countries. Um, and again, I've tried to summarize it for you. Um, you know, educated people still want Anglophone countries. Canada is uh, climbing up uh, the ladder. And like I said, uh, Arab hubs like Dubai and the UAE and Asian countries are climbing. Now let's talk about digital nomads, right? who again are favoring affordability and fast internet speed. So if you kind of just create these ranking lists of which countries have fast internet and have an affordable cost of living, um, and just, just kind of look at which places rank high, you're seeing like, you know, places from Argentina to Thailand and Mexico and even, um, you know, Berlin and whatnot pop up on the radar as desirable places. And I've got friends who are in the recruitment space who are in a working for American multinationals who are traveling abroad to recruit talent and corral them into co-working spaces or micro offices so, because they know they're not going to leave. They love life in Lisbon or Athens, but they want them working as offshore talent for American companies. So you're not going to get them to come back to you. You have to go to them. And that's part of what we're seeing happening now as well. And all of this is going digital. Right, because of COVID and remote work, but even under deep underlying trends, even like blockchain and crypto, digital remote education, you can get nano degrees online, get Wi Fi everywhere. You can have co living, co working, car sharing memberships where young people who don't like to own stuff, they just have a membership, right? I'm going to stay in this condo in this country, in this city, and then month to month, and then I can just, you know, register myself to stay in the partner facility. Uh, in Berlin or in Tbilisi or in Dubai, and I'll just bounce around. And that's literally the way young people think about the world today is, hey, I could pretty much be anywhere and access these services anywhere. So you have to cope with that. You have to figure out what are the hubs. Again, follow the young people is my fundamental message, because in the global war for talent, the countries that are attracting young people and the companies that keep those young people and have their offices where those young people want to be, they're going to be the winners in the global war for talent. So let me stop right there and look forward to our discussion. Prague, that was fantastic. Give him a round of applause real quick. Thank you. Uh, honestly, there's so much content there. It's like I each slide could have been a talk because it just, you got you know, so much to absorb. Um, I want everybody real quick to um, log into the live stream real quick, and I want you to put your questions into the live stream. Like it, check in, do whatever you want to do, throw your questions in there. That'd be great because that's a great way for me to aggregate them and to let the people uh, at home also share in the experience. We've got a couple questions coming in. I've got a couple of my own. I'm really torn right now. Which ones I should prioritize? Should I be nice? All right, I'll be nice. All right, let's, uh, let's do the ones here um, coming in here. Um, Brian Liparopoulos, who is the vice president of the International Association of Movers, says, uh, one question I have is relative to the potential for a new Cold War where the international order breaks back down along two blocks. How does Prague see that impacting human mobility, especially in light of the slide we're looking at? I think you was talking about a previous slide. And then Drew Phillips also asks, you know, in terms of cyber wars and things of like that, um, how do those types of conflicts that could kind of 
cleave the world into maybe two large blocks. I mean, do you see what do you see the likelihood of that being, and how might that affect mobility? Right. No, these are these are great questions. Um, now, first on the just the the general geopolitics of a divided world. Well, to be honest, the world isn't divided. The world is opportunistic. We someone may have told you, and many people may have said. The future is going to be a new Cold War divided between America and China. Well, that's really not true. Uh, China may think that, and people in America might think that. But the entire speaking on behalf of the entire rest of the planet, that's not the way people are thinking. People are thinking, what's in it for me? How do I get the best deal as Saudi Arabia or Brazil or India or Germany, for that matter? And what they're saying is, I'm going to play all sides. I'm going to trade with China, but I'm going to buy weapons from America. I'm going to do this business with India and I'm going to cut this deal here and there. So that's what I call multi-alignment. So talent is saying, I'm going to go where the best deal is. Where can I get a visa? You know, not am I loyal to this country or this country? Am I taking this side or that side in this so-called new Cold War? The cyber stuff is key. I mean, I think in and of itself in, in, in that companies obviously have to um, increasingly cater to or follow local regulations around, um, uh, you know, where they, where and how they domicile data and so forth. And so that's called, you know, kind of technological nationalism. That's not just China. That's like every country is doing that more and more because they view technology as a national security issue and they want companies to invest more in their local economy and conditions and upgrading and innovating and transferring knowledge. So there's a lot of motivations behind that. Um, but I think that's just part and parcel. But you can see that clearly, even geopolitical rivalry, even technological competition and cyber war are still totally consistent with a world in which billions of people are relocating for lots of different reasons. So you can have these things happening at the same time, and they are happening at the same time. Awesome. We got some more questions coming in. Put them in the comments on the LinkedIn live stream here. Um, we've got some really cool stuff coming in here. I've got Tim Hellenthal here. Hey, Tim. Good to see you, buddy. I love you guys. Can I just say that for a second? I, just, I love y'all so much. All right, here we go. Um, Tim says, predictions are often spoiled by the unexpected black swan event. When you look back at what was predicted 30 years ago and see what we got wrong, how has that impacted your predictions and or where you think that your variables might prove to even be more variable than you predict? I mean, how much risk is there in these, some of these projections and, and what are some of the things that could really throw this off? Well, I try to actually build some of my forecasts on the things that we know we got spectacularly wrong, and now we know why we got them wrong. And so we have more accurate predictions today than we did then. So again, demographics is one of them. If you go back 25, 30 years, people thought the world population was going to reach 15 billion people. You know, Now we see the writing on the wall that we're going to be peaking at around 9 billion people within the next 10 to 15 years. So we got a lot wrong, which is part of why we're now starting to get it right. And that's happened in a lot of areas. We got our energy forecasts wrong. We thought that we were going to reach peak oil. Well, because of renewable energy, alternative energy, and uh, efficiencies, we and of course, the more production, right, more oil and gas supplies being discovered, we are never going to have peak oil, right? We have a glut of oil and gas uh, in the world. And again, all the renewables and alternatives that are coming on stream. So I don't worry. Um, I don't understand so what you just said. Here. Are, you saying, are you saying we're never going to run out of gas and oil? Is that, is that what you're saying? No, not even close. I don't know. I mean, you remember all the books okay. that were titled Peak Oil or End of Oil? You remember all those books? Peak Oil, End of Oil, and all that? And all that? I didn't read them. Well, those I mean, are I'm gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so those okay, books, cool. like, you know, those you could you could recycle those right but that does not to say that we're going to burn it all because from a regulatory standpoint we're trying to cut back and reduce our dependency on fossil fuels for environmental reasons which is obviously uh the the, the wise thing to do but all that does is it means that we're actually paying some countries are paying or regulating or taxing oil and gas companies to obviously not extract right so it's not about you know there's a famous line the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stone Right. We haven't run out of stone. We're not running out of oil. That's not the issue. It's it's how do you achieve the maximum resource efficiency? Awesome. OK, cool. I'm learning stuff um, in your in your book. You describe uh, kind of four different ways 
this whole thing could play out, you know, four different ways with climate change that, that it can play out. And, um, and one of them is, is really bad. <laughs> one of them, I think you call it like the, um, the uh, it's like the Mad Max scenario, right? You know, what is, the, what is the likelihood that the Mad Max scenario plays out due to climate change? Um, and, and how do we prevent that? Yeah, that's a that's a careful reader. I did. I tried to match each scenario to a movie because I figure that's how we think. You know, and I'm a, I'm a Hollywood junkie too. So has everyone um, seen Mad Max here? Show of hands, real quick. We've all seen it, right? Okay, so we're gonna start donning masks and riding through the desert on dune buggies and cannibalize. I mean, how 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 close is that? Not this afternoon. I mean, how close is that gonna that be? Well, so it is this afternoon in some places. And then the thing about scenarios, and especially those scenarios, the way I constructed them is that all four of them, whether it is what I call Northern Lights, which is a flourishing future of circulation of people and climate resilient locations, or whether it's fortresses, regional fortresses, where we're trying to prevent illegals from coming in from Latin America and Europe is literally shooting dead, you know, and letting sink to death and drown migrants coming across the Mediterranean. We have a fortress situation. Then I talk about the new Middle Ages, which or barbarians at the gate. And these are these Mad Max kind of scenarios of low sustainability and volatile and uncontrolled migration. Well, we have that. It's called North Africa, right? We have that. It's Central America, you know, places of resource scarcity, high stress and a high desire to, to move, but a lot of barriers. And so local competition for resources that is happening in some places. We don't want America to be like that, but we have a mega drought. Australia has a mega drought. There are places that are literally no longer livable, you know? Um, and so again, it doesn't have to be violent like a Mad Max movie. But my point is that if you see that scenario coming, what are you gonna do to prevent it? Are you gonna relocate people? Are you gonna invest in more technology? Are you gonna be, you know, conserve resources? What are the things that you do to prevent that? And that's part of why it links to the previous question because the reason, when you are warned about something, you can overreact to it in a good way. We were warned about the population going through the roof in the 1960s. 1968 in particular is when the Club of Rome report titled Limits to Growth was published, right? And in 1971, 72, 73 were the oil shocks, the OPEC oil shocks, when oil became a weapon and we had to pay um, you know, huge premium for oil imports. Those events sparked changes in policy, right? Birth control, population control measures. In the latter case, the Nixon administration uh, opening up or, or, or establishing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the SP, SPR. Countries started to do things to prevent the horrible things from happening that we either were afraid would happen or that, were, that started to happen. And so when we overreacted to those things 50 years ago, we're either reaping the benefits or the consequences today. That's how these things bend over time. Um, so if you are really worried about the climate crisis, even if it doesn't wind up being as bad as we thought, the reason it didn't wind up becoming as bad as we thought is because we are overreacting today in the right way. It, it's not really that hard to, to understand. I think you know exactly what I'm saying. And we've done this before as a civilization, right? We brought the world population to a peak. It was growing like this. We're like, whoa, that's a bit too much. Right. We're like, hey, wait, OPEC countries are going to punish us. They own all the oil. No way. Let's distribute oil production. We're doing it today with semiconductors. We're doing it today with rare earth minerals. The semiconductors are like, whoa, too much dependency on Taiwan. TSMC start making chips in Arizona. Right. Uh, rare earth minerals. China controls all the production of rare earth minerals. We don't like that. Let's start mining them from Australia to Argentina to Greenland to Canada. Um, and let's start processing them around the world. So we do not have a single point of failure. We're actually learning, believe it or not. We're learning all the time. I, I love the way you describe this because I think a lot of times we paint the picture that we're hurtling towards an inevitable demise and we're leaving out the part where we are course correcting somewhat. I don't yes. know if we're hurtling towards an inevitable demise or not. Perhaps we are. Maybe we have the ability to pump the brakes a little bit. You mentioned something in passing there, you know, hey, TSMC, come to Arizona and make your chips here. It's interesting because we actually have people involved in those relocations right now in this room right now. And so I want to kind of tie that in and ask you how much of this global mobility that you're describing is self-directed, independent, 
um, the unction of a young person or perhaps a student versus how much of it is company sponsored kind of corporate relocation? Because I mean, let's be honest, that's what a lot of us are concerned with is the shrinking nature of corporate sponsored relocation. Mm -hmm. How do you see that playing out? This is a great question. So um, again, on the, on the one hand, the talent pool is growing because you have so many young people alive today who are mobile and want to be mobile. So if you are facing a decline in your numbers, it has to do not necessarily with the underlying demographics, which is a huge number, billion, four and a half billion young people in the world. It has to do with politics, with their skill sets, with the competition, or the fact that you are actually competing with governments. If governments are saying, I'm gonna cut out the corporate middleman and open my borders to young people, and you can just go and apply online. A young person can say, I'm gonna go live in, um, in, uh, in Portugal or in Dubai or in uh, Kazakhstan or Japan. And because the government is letting me in, the government is giving me a visa. I don't need a company to facilitate or do any of that work, right? Well, then they don't need you. But so you have to focus more in those situations on matching, right? Matching the person to the job, to the company, to the person that might hire them because they just want to go. They're not loyal to any one brand, right? Young people are totally mercenary, right? What company they work for, they'll, they'll change jobs every, every year, every six months, right? I have a hard time keeping my people. I just have to keep paying them more, basically. But I've had people internally relocate. I'll give you a couple of examples because they're going, they've gone to Canada and a couple to Germany. You know, they were in Asia. And they did their own. They never asked me, right? Because I run a remote global platform. Uh, they were like, hey, by the way, just want you to know I'm going to be on a different time zone for uh, the rest of my life. Right. So deal with it. That's basically the way young people are talking to me. And that's how they're how talking to me. How did that make life. you feel as a CEO? I mean, like, I mean, were you like, uh, OK, or like, you know, you can't work here under that arrangement? Or were you concerned about the, the immigration and taxation issues of it? I mean, how did you I'm just kind of curious personally how you how you handled that when you when you well to that. get talent in the first place you've got to be digital first not everyone look i mean if you're you know huge company with a giant headquarters and you know you're offering lots of free food and massages and ping pong like okay you know maybe a lot of people want to be there if the rent is affordable bear in mind that google itself has had trouble attracting young talent to move to silicon valley because it's so expensive so it was driven by the workers who said, can you open an office in Pittsburgh, right? Can I just stay in, you know, in, in, a, in a lower cost area? And so Google has started building these smaller hubs and campuses everywhere. And the other tech companies have too, like Austin, obviously, right? Is a good example. The same thing applies globally. So, you know, I, but for, in my case, just attracting talent had to be remote. It was during COVID anyway. And I know that that's just how young people behave. So I've been able to retain them to the company, even if I can't control their geography. Loving it, loving it. I've got a couple questions, but I, I wanna I wanna come out into the crowd. <clears throat> Is everybody getting nervous? Okay. I wanna come out in the crowd because I want to hear your questions. A couple of y'all have texted me, so I'm just gonna like approach you as if like we didn't plan it. And um I, I wanna get the questions from y'all. So get your questions ready. Sound smart. We only got 10 minutes to do it. Here you go. Wow. <laughs> This was really a powerful keynote and sure. Um, hi everybody, Tom Brune. Tom Brune, everybody, give him a round of applause. Oh, you, <laughs> this is powerful. You know, we've seen uh, jugglers at some for a keynote yeah. and we've seen rappers, but you know, when you leave, when you leave the conference, it doesn't make you think that much, does it? So anyway, this is fantastic. Um, Couple questions. One of them is about Canada because you focused on that as being uh, one of the mo more progressive countries. What do you think, Parag, about the fact that Canada is passing legislation that tells people that are moving there, if you're not a citizen, you can't buy a house? Is that going to help us here in the state? No, I, I don't know, but I'm just curious. Do you think that's a misstep on their part, or do you think that's something that can be alleviated? Right. So that is an affordable housing issue, and it's partially geopolitical. They don't want to see their property markets 
um, appreciate too much and price out locals because rich investors have come in and bought up all the choice housing. And that's what's happened. But I would blame the government for, on the one hand, inviting in and opening its borders and attracting talent from all over the world, uh, but then not taking into account the housing demand. Right. That's just dumb. You know, the one universal crisis that I always say, it's actually not climate change. The one universal crisis is affordable housing. There are a lot of places where people aren't yet paying full attention to climate change. They don't care. The public doesn't care. They're not necessarily getting slammed with typhoons all the time. But the one universal one is affordable housing. Find me one place on earth where people don't complain about affordable housing. So you would think that Canada would have put two and two together and said, hey, if we're going to increase our population by 500,000 to a million people every single year, and all those people want to live in Toronto or Vancouver, uh, maybe we should build more housing. And they didn't. So now you have to pass this legisl legislation, you have to scapegoat foreigners and all this kind of stuff. But all you had to do is build more affordable housing. And we need to do it, and every country needs to do it. Yeah, one more question, and I promise it'll be... No, left. it's the Tom Bruce I, show. Go ahead. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> so your line in the sand for youth seems to be millennial, and that makes sense to everybody here. I'm a baby boomer. I'm a millennial. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I'm a baby boomer, so I have to ask you, what do you see the role for Gen X and baby boomer as far as this kind of future trending that you're talking about? I think we can all agree on Gen X, right? We can just... No, all right. <laughs> Gen X, Gen X isn't necessarily uh, washed up yet, and nor nor are boomers because you've got um, longer life expectancy. You have digital connectivity and flexibility. You have worker shortages and skill shortages that older workers can fill uh, with their knowledge and experience. So there are a lot of things. You have the retirement age being raised. A lot of things are happening at the same time that are allowing for people of all demographics to still be involved in the labor force flexibly, again, if they have skills. So the real divide is not, are you young or old? The real divide is, are you skilled or unskilled? Are you mobile or immobile, right? That, that's the way I would break it down. So if you're older and mobile, I mean, you might not keep on working, right? Be a consultant, travel around, do work in different places. If you're young and mobile, same thing. But if you're young and immobile, meaning you're trapped in a country you know, an African country or something where you have no prospects, that's the worst situation to be in, right? Or to be old and immobile, but not be able to afford your own retirement. Um, that's another situation. So that, that I wouldn't generalize, I'd rather break it down into the, these kind of, this kind of quadrant system and, um, and figure out how, if you're, if you're in one of the bad quadrants, quote unquote, what are you going to do about it? You know, and how can you, that's why I say the highest virtue is mobility, right? Being mobile is itself a virtue. Um, being able to adapt to changing circumstances, whether it's geopolitical, economic, technological, or environmental, right? Whatever it is that's going on that you can't control, right? We can't control all those things, but can we react to them? Can we navigate accordingly? Those are the things we did, that, you know, being mobile will help you solve. All right, awesome. We got some uh, questions popping up now. You're making us think here, Prague. Great. First, Ben, thank you for putting this together. This is amazing. Great session, Parag. Let's big shout out. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, so uh, my question is this. So I work with a lot of organizations that are sourcing talent globally in many remote locations because they're able to find that talent. So my question for you, Parag, is what are the top three destinations for a diverse talent base location-wise? So in the can whole we do world? A, can we do a U.S. and global top three? Yeah. So the U.S. scene is, again, pretty, pretty dynamic. I mean, you know, you've got your Austins and, and Denver's and Raleigh, North Carolina's and Atlanta's and Miami's that are really popping up and competing partially or at least according to the media, you know, with New York and L.A. and San Francisco. But by the numbers, they're not really, you know, I mean, New York and L.A., even as they lose population, as they literally are, they're still so much bigger than any other place, you know, so like San Francisco, bear in mind, has only 500, 600,000 people. That's it, right? That's a tiny, tiny borough of New York to put things in perspective. Is there a huge economic output? Obviously there is. 
Um, so, but I think that you'll see changes over time as Americans get used to becoming mobile again, relocating again, because it'll be a cost issue, a climate issue, a, a job issue. Some companies will say back to the office, others won't. But I think those cities I just mentioned, you know, have some staying power. I can imagine a renaissance of Detroit. You know, I can imagine uh, a whole bunch of places that are not yet super primed. Like, you know, well, Seattle actually really is doing great. And I think from a climate standpoint is very strong and very innovative, obviously. So it's well proven. And I think Seattle can maintain, maintain that status. Um, so, you know, we've got our 10 or 15 winners. And that's good, by the way. A lot of countries only have like one city that anyone wants to live in. And if anything goes wrong there, they're, they're toast, right? So internationally, though, I track this very closely. And again, Canada is doing really well. Um, England, despite Brexit, is attracting lots of young people. Um, Germany is doing very well in attracting talent. Look at Berlin, heaving with young people. Um, uh, uh, Dubai, the UAE, growing gangbusters. I mean, they are, they are doling out these golden visas to everyone. You know what's happening? You know, Greece is probably the next Portugal in terms of where young people want to go and settle and be digital nomads. So uh, Japan, super hot Japan. Young people are moving to Japan hand over fist. Um, so lots and lots and lots of places. Again, there's very clear and transparent data on this that you can track and follow. And again, if you're not the one facilitating it, go there anyway and be the one who helps to um, you know, organize that, that young talent and get them the jobs they need and want. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, you missed Dallas, though. Um, what could go wrong? Oh, sorry. Dallas is actually doing great. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. Thanks, Prague. Yeah, it's the people in Dallas that struggle. Um, all right. So, Ryan Smith, um, we got another question here. Introduce yourself. Thanks again for the, uh, for the presentation and another shout out to me. I'm also going to do a little, as a dual citizen, a little shout out to my native Canada. Um, I, I love. A reluctant, a reluctant round of applause. Yeah. And I've set up my own little telepar prompter here that faded out and yeah. sort of the glass so didn't break. Job, yeah. But I want to read my question I posted because I think I'll sound a lot smarter that way. Um, so you mentioned the recent trends on national populism. Um, how do you see sort of geopolitical friction developing, especially over the next, say, five to ten years? You know, we're starting to see some countries trying to legislate policies that are um, more and more kind of anti-migration. I'm just sort of curious how you see that, you know, albeit sort of myopic and... Uh, and, and not really embracing the, the expanding globalism that's going to happen uh, inevitably. But how do you see that playing out over kind of the next five to 10 years? Sure. I mean, that's an actually an easy one because they say that, but they're not doing it. You know, even in countries where you see a lot of this anti-immigrant legislation, look at the numbers. Don't look at what, pol never look at what politicians say. Only look at what the country is actually doing. Even places like Italy, Germany, wherever you have far right movements, believe it or not, the foreign populations just keep on growing. So look at the numbers. You know, Brexit, again, the, the foreign population in the UK is growing and growing and growing. So in the real world, all of that talk is just scapegoating. It's not illegitimate in the sense that, look, people have genuine concerns. Jobs are being taken. There is stress on the social system. All of that is fair. But the reality is, more people, especially young people, moving more and more all the time. So, um, so yeah, that's what's going on. Um, I just want to say, uh, Ben, I unfortunately have to jump in a second, but I can take one more really quick one. Be good, okay? <laughs> it's the last one, okay? Easy one to answer oh, gosh, it's going to be a hard one, Prague. Uh, hi, Prague. I'm Elizabeth Soli with Jacob Street. So you've kind of hinted that America isn't doing so well in attracting talent. Um, given the current political situation and the rise in nationalism, is there anything that can be done to help us rectify this situation where we are able to continue to grow and have um, intelligent young people and also you know, sustain social security and all of the kind of governmental systems that we're used to? And more uh -huh. Asian youth. 
Right. Well, no, again, you know, so I don't want to say that we're not doing well. We're America is still by far number one in attracting new migrants every single year. And it started to go down in 2014 from a high of around a million. It hit rock bottom during Trump and COVID, but it shot back up again to record levels. Right. So America is still getting the most. But is it always the best? And is it consistent? That's where we're facing more competition from Canada, Britain, Germany, and so forth. So we just got to be careful that we're not always going to be the top choice for everyone because people want to go to a place where they have a clear pathway to citizenship with less and without hassle. And other countries are learning how to copy those better digital immigration systems that are super incentive incentivized to get your passport within three years to show up. And, you know, a lot of people, I see it all the time, they'll take Germany over the U.S. if they know that they're going to, you know, have a, have a, not have to deal with immigration authorities, you know, month after month. Totally. And Canada, absolutely. So we're still by the numbers getting the most, but we're going to have to fight to keep that status. There's no question. And we have, again, clear data on that. Great question, though. Thank you. Awesome. Let's give Parag a round of applause. Thank you so much, Parag Khan, everybody. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for everybody watching at home there. Um, hit that like button one more time for us. Uh, feel free to check in in the comments. Uh, I know we didn't get to all the questions here. We do want to take a break, but I wanted to, to see, was there anybody um, that learned anything from that that surprised them? Yeah, a couple, couple people, yeah. My dad. Hey, dad. Can everybody say hi to my dad? Love you, dad. Um, do you want to share what that was, dad? He's like, I don't know what you want me to do with this thing. <laughs> I was just uh, shocked at the, um, at the uh, countries that are the prime uh, yeah. re uh, recipients of this immigration. Yeah. Yeah, and, and how about the fact that how many people were surprised that the U.S. wasn't number one? I mean, right? I mean, we always kind of tell ourselves that we're the top destination for talented people globally. You want and, and one of the things that I don't know that I was shocked, but I was uh, I learned this uh, uh, demographic, this Asian youth demographic yeah. was really uh, uh, amazing. And the fact that uh, that the relocation potential there is so uh, enormous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it makes sense when we kind of look around, right? But maybe we don't look around and kind of take stock. Of it. I'm going to ask um, Rachel real quick. Is there something you, you learned here that you thought was interesting? Yeah, sure. Um, I was really, I actually didn't know that the world population that we're at the peak and we're going to decline. Maybe it was just me, but I had no idea about that. <laughs> Did anybody else think we were at peak population in the world and that it wasn't going to keep? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I asked that question properly. I don't know what you thought, Tim, now. What did you think about the peak population thing, Tim? Tim knew that? All right, Tim, go away. All right. Sorry, Tim knows everything, um, but we knew that. Hey, um, real quick, um, I just want to make a couple of announcements. I want to also thank, really thank, really genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank um, our sponsors, Prime Lending. Can we give him a round of hand? Scott Chapman. Scott, thank you so much. I also want to thank our, uh, our good friend and sponsor, uh, Aversal Global Relocation here, Jose Abali. Thank you so much. We couldn't have afforded Parag Khanna without these people, so uh, thank them. Uh, buy them a drink later. Um, how about everybody goes on a break, y'all? Good? Let's take a break. All right. We'll be right back in five, seven.